Thank you for attending the Food Safety Matters webinar series today. Our topic today is hand washing and its challenges. Our featured speaker is Dr. Anna Sorovan. Dr. Sorovan is, is trained in disease prevention and epidemiology and is a certified food safety professional. She started her career in an epidemiological station in Russia, controlling and enforcing food safety in children and adolescent organizations. Later, she worked in a hospital setting as a clinical microbiologist with an emphasis on antibiotic resistance and nosocomial infections. After her immigration to the U.S. in 1991, Dr. Sharobin joined Ecolab and has been managing the microbiology group for over 20 years. Her responsibilities cover food safety, environmental testing, equipment evaluation, outbreak prevention and recovery, regulatory support, product development, and research done for Eagle Lab quick service and food retail customers in the U.S. and internationally. Dr. Sturobin is actively involved in industry food safety work. She chairs the Interdisciplinary Food Board Investigation Training CFP Committee, as a member of CFP 2012 Issue Committee, and a member of the North Carolina Food Code Transition Team. Dr. Sturobin is an author of several publications and patents. She gives food safety talks covering topics such as cleaning and sanitization, equipment design, hand care, environmental testing, and outbreak prevention and recovery um, around the globe. It is my pleasure to introduce now Dr. Anna Sturovan. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for joining this webinar. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, try to share with you some of my thoughts, some of the information which I gathered uh, throughout uh, the time working uh, on this topic, and uh, hopefully I would be able to answer some of your questions. Uh, the topic of the presentation, as Gina said, is hand washing and its challenges. During today's presentation, uh, I'm going to cover several topics. Uh, I will talk about hand-related outbreaks and contributing factors. I will talk about hand care regulations, about hand washing compliance, hand product efficacy testing such as swabbing, testing in vitro, testing in viva, and I'll talk a little bit about antimicrobial soaps versus plain soaps. Um, the first slide has a list of pathogens transmitted by food contaminated by infected persons. As you can see, uh, the list is, uh, uh, cons consists from bacteria and viruses. Noroviruses first, hepatitis A is the second one, Salmonella typhi, Shigella species, uh, Staph aureus, and Streptococcus. Uh, this next slide uh, presents the number of foodborne illness outbreaks reported to CDC for the period of uh, 98 to 2002 that were associated with hand contact with or without gloves. Norovirus was the dominant etiology for both bare hand and glove hand contact. Note, however, that 40% of the bare hand contact outbreaks and 35% of gloved hand outbreaks involved bacteria agents. Uh, as you can see from this table, the number, uh, total number of outbreaks uh, connected to gloved hand contact is less uh, for both bacterial and uh, viral uh, etiology of the outbreaks. Uh, the next slide uh, uh, shows the hand uh, and personal hygiene um, role in contributing to the foodborne illness. During the time period of 98 to 2002, bare hand contact ranked to number two. Food handling by an infected worker ranked number four. And gloved hand contact ranked number 14 as a contributing factor for those outbreaks. This included outbreaks of known and unknown etiology. Because of that, as you may notice, uh, when you add these percentage, percentages, uh, they not necessarily will end up to be 100%. Uh, 
Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, food uh, service hand, uh, hand care regulations. So, uh, as we all know, uh, food code uh, regulates uh, the hand washing processes. It tells us when to wash, how to wash, and for how long, and it shows us requirements and use of hand sanitizers in uh, the food code hand sanitizers are called antiseptics. It talks about glove use and about no bare hand contact with ready to eat foods. And it also talks about hand washing sinks and uh, requirements for its installation. So in terms of when to wash, uh, we all know that, but I just put uh, the quote from the food code just to show how many uh, occasions we need to think about when we have to wash our hands. Uh, it is uh, immediately before engaging in food preparation, after touching bare human body parts, after using the toilet room, after caring for or handling uh, service or aquatic animals, after coughing, sneezing, using handkerchief, after handling soiled equipment and utensils, during food preparation as often as necessary, when switching between work with raw food and working with ready to eat food, before donning gloves for working with food, after engaging in other activities where hands could be contaminated. As you can see, it's a lot of events when we have to wash our hands, and it's not necessarily uh, something we do at home. Therefore, training uh, has essential part in making sure that we communicated these needs to uh, the employees and workers um, in the restaurant or grocery setting. Uh, this is another slide which talks about how to wash hands, which seems to be uh, obvious. We all know how to wash hands. But um, as you will see from my uh, further slides, uh, it's not as uh, easy to follow as uh, to know how to wash hands. Um, again, uh, hands should be washed for about 20 seconds. Uh, Hands should be wet and then soap applied. And uh, after 10, 15 seconds uh, of rubbing hands together, we rinse hands and then we dry. So that part is kind of obvious. Uh, the last bullet point, uh, use towel to turn off the faucet, is not as obvious to everybody, even though it is included in a food code. Um, the reason behind uh, this requirement is that when we uh, come to the sink to wash our hands, we open the faucet with our dirty hands, therefore contaminating this faucet. Then we wash our hands, and uh, when we leave, we close the faucet again, contaminating our hands with this, uh, by this dirty faucet. Um, therefore, the food code requires to use towels to turn off the faucet. Uh, it is important to note that um, state food codes may vary from U.S. food code, and as we all know, uh, not uh, all the uh, states or local uh, authorities has adopted uh, the latest 2009 food code. Uh, in terms of hand antiseptics, uh, I'm not going to uh, read everything on this slide. It's kind of busy. But the main point to show how busy it is that uh, not all hand antiseptics available uh, are um, appropriate to be used in um, uh, food, in, uh, food uh, service environment. So when you are choosing uh, your hand antiseptics, you need to make sure and work with your uh, hand care provider that these um, hand antiseptics meet uh, the requirements listed in the food code. Um, again, this is a little slide talking about using hand sanitizers. Uh, the main part of this is that the uh, hand sanitizers per food code should be used only on the pre-clean hands. Therefore, uh, we cannot just uh, install hand sanitizer in the kitchen and uh, apply hand sanitizer without prior hand washing. Uh, Food code also addresses uh, the uh, hand washing sinks and their installations. Uh, we are asked 
to uh, have hand wash sinks which shall be equipped to provide water at a temperature of at least 100 degrees Fahrenheit through a mixing valve or combination faucet. Uh, the hand wash sink should be located to allow convenient use by employees. They shall be accessible at all times for employee use and, shall, and they may not be used for purposes other than hand washing. And again, as I mentioned, uh, the numbers and uh, requirements could be different from state to state. Uh, as many of you may remember, in the prior versions of a food code, uh, 110 degrees uh, of uh, water um, uh, was listed in the, f in the food codes. So some of the uh, states are still using this number instead of the latest 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, all antimicrobial hand products are regulated under the uh, document uh, called FDA tentative final monograph. Uh, these antimicrobial hand care products are considered to be drugs by FDA. This document uh, lists antimicrobials and the levels allowed for their use. Um, this document tells us how effective this product should be, and it to also tells us that uh, these antimicrobial uh, hand care products should be manufactured under good manufacturing practice. Uh, this slide is several uh, slides that are going to show some uh, um, latest information uh, which was uh, uh, received by uh, f uh, received from the FDA trend analysis report. So we just summarized it to show you that everything I just talked about in terms of regulations uh, that we definitely have some uh, room for improvement in terms of compliance with the regulations we just discussed. So uh, according to this uh, FDA trend analysis report on the occurrence of foodborne illness risk factors, uh, from 98 to 2008, uh, proper and adequate hand washing uh, out of compliance was pretty high. So the numbers here is uh, when people did not properly wash uh, their hands, so it's out of compliance. So uh, the data, the light blue line, line is um, showing the data for 1998, the dark light is 2003, and the dark blue light shows us 2008. So this way uh, we would be able to see the dynamics of the uh, improvement or uh, lack of it. So as you can see, the food service restaurants in, um, in, in 1998 uh, was uh, in 82 percent was out of compliance in terms of pro proper adequate hand washing. In uh, 2003, the numbers improved and became uh, 73, and in 2008, uh, they're better than they were in 98, but a little bit worse than they were in 2000. Uh, three. As you can see, the variation is very little, so really uh, nothing much happened uh, in terms of uh, compliance in food service restaurants. Uh, in fast food restaurants, uh, from 55% in 98 in 2003, uh, the level, uh, the percent out of compliance uh, uh, is 39, so it is definitely an improvement but apparently we again have uh, some uh, room uh, for improvement. Uh, the same is true for retail produce, retail meat and poultry, and retail deli. So uh, that's um, showing us some um, challenges which we all uh, face. Uh, the next slide is uh, talking about no bare hand contact, as uh, I mentioned in uh, my one of the previous slides, also has been a big contributing factor into outbreaks. And uh, for food service restaurants in 2008, the uh, out of compliance percentage was 46. For fast food, it was 26. And uh, retail, 6. 
uh, percent and uh, retail daily six percent. As you can see, we have a very uh, good positive dynamics. It's a statistical difference where there is apparently a, a pretty good uh, improvement uh, in 2008 compared to 1998, but still uh, we have uh, room for improvement as in a previous slide. Uh, the next slide, again, uh, related to hand-washing facilities, and uh, you can connect it with the requirements which I mentioned in uh, one of my previous slides. Again, you can see that there is quite a few um, situations when um, uh, the uh, facilities uh, and the accessibility are out of compliance. The next slide... Um, uh, hand washing sometimes attempted but not appropriate. It is uh, this slide was taken from a uh, an observational study, which was conducted across uh, uh, the U.S. 321 restaurants, 196 independent and 212 chain or franchises. Workers were observed for a median of 48 minutes and the median number of work activities that should have required hand washing was 8.6 per hour. So you can connect that information with uh, um, my reading the uh, situations when people have to wash hands, and according to this paper, it is about 8.6 times per hour. Appropriate hand washing, including hands under running water with soap and using a towel, towel to dry them uh, happened to be only in 27% of, uh, of the cases. An attempt at hand washing, including removing gloves if worn and putting hands under running water with or without water and with or without drying uh, happened to be in pretty high numbers. You can see uh, placed uh, hands under running water, 32%. Hands under running water in used soap, apparently with no towel, 28%. Placed hands under running water in dried uh, uh, hands with a towel but no soap, 31%. So uh, there is a pretty uh, sad picture. People still uh, need to learn how to wash their hands. Now, uh, this next slide is uh, talking about uh, um, a, another study uh, which uh, concluded that only five per there is only 5% hand washing compliance uh, with the food code in restaurants. Um, I found it to be very interesting uh, numbers here. It not only talks about frequency uh, of hand washing, but also covers uh, the procedural uh, part of the hand washing. As you can see in blue, 72% uh, of the people wash their hands before engaging in food preparation. 28% uh, uh, wash their hands when entering food pre preparation area. 33% wash their hands after cleaning hands. Everything else is much less after touching bare skin and clothing, after coughing and sneezing, with switching from raw to ready-to-eat food in this study, nobody even attempted to wash their hands. Uh, interestingly, uh, the second part of this table, the procedural part, tells us that even in the high percentage of people washing hands, in this study, nobody washed their hands right. So again, it's again repeat to, to uh, similar to, uh, information similar to the previous slide that procedurally we uh, definitely can uh, have more training done. Uh, so why is the compliance so poor? And uh, according to multiple literature, uh, there are several reasons. Uh, the ones which I list here definitely not, in, not, not, not all of them are listed here, but their main ones are people are complaining for a heavy workload. They don't have time to wash their hands. Sinks are poorly located and not, pro not uh, properly supplied with soap or towels. People complain of skin irritation, and definitely if you don't have um, 
warm water or if you don't have a good uh, hand care product or um, if people are washing hands uh, too many times, which apparently is not happening, they may complain uh, for skin irritation. People say that they don't feel that their hands look dirty, so they don't need to wash their hands. They believe that hand washing takes too long, and we talked about uh, the need of uh, 20 seconds hand wash. And matter of fact, it's longer than 20 seconds because you need to go to the sink and come back. Uh, assumption that gloves wearing replaces some of the hand washing. Uh, people believe that if they are wearing gloves, they are protected and the food is protected and therefore they don't need to wash their hands. And actually, many studies show that it is the case. Lack of support from managers and co-workers for hand washing. That also has been observed and uh, published heavily. And uh, lack of training and accountability. Uh, now I switch gears a little bit to uh, the hand care products. Um, many people are using hand care products which uh, are antimicrobial. And uh, uh, they are trying to understand how to choose hand care products and how they are different one from another. So people are uh, making an attempt to do um, to evaluate hand care products uh, the way they understand is right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the most common um, ways of people doing it if they uh, did not consult with people who uh, do it for a living. The question uh, we are asked very often, can I evaluate a product efficacy by swabbing hands? So before I um, answer this question, I'd like to talk about two types of bacteria which are residing on our hands. So first type of bacteria, which is called transient bacteria. This is a bacteria which are picked up by food handlers and reside on hands only temporarily. These bacteria do not survive or colonize on normal skin. This actually is the bacteria which we should worry about. All the Salmonella, Shigella, uh, Hepatitis, uh, this is not bacteria which normally leaves uh, on our hands, and in this little uh, picture, we kind of try to uh, show this uh, travelers who come and go. Another uh, group of the bacteria called resident bacteria. Uh, this is a bacteria natural, which is natural part of our skin. We all have it, and we all should have it. This uh, bacteria is attached to the skin and not easy to remove. This bacteria is little threat to a foodborne disease, and it also can serve as a guard. Um, it competes for nutrition with this uh, transient bacteria. It, com it colonizes the spaces which potentially could be taken by transient bacteria, and some of this microorganism produces metabolic products uh, some of which could be antimicrobial. So we don't really uh, care about removing most of the residual bacteria. Um, on this slide, um, I wanted to talk about, um, again, the results of the uh, evaluation by swabbing. So when swabbing is performed uh, for presence of E. coli or coliforms or whatever other pathogens people decide to look for, um, after hand washing, the results obtained uh, do not allow us to evaluate hand care products. Since we do not know how um, did we have this E. coli or coliforms before we started to wash our hands, so uh, by not finding E. coli or coliforms, uh, we are not necessarily able to say that the product we are evaluating is good uh, because we may not kill or remove anything. Some people evaluate 
total bacteria counts of hands on hands, which are resident uh, microorganisms in many cases, most of them. And when swabbing is performed and total bacteria counts are evaluated, similar to the E. coli testing, we cannot make any conclusions about hand care products. Different people have different skill properties, different pH, and therefore may have high or low bacteria counts on hands before and after hand washing. And therefore, we cannot say is it the properties uh, and numbers on the hands related to the individual uh, uh, skin properties or because of the product we have used. Uh, more appropriate approach of evaluating hand care products is uh, laboratory testing. Uh, this testing is normally controlled and uh, it is uh, normally followed, established, and approved um, ASTM or EN test method. Uh, EN is a method which are commonly uh, which are used in Europe. Uh, I'm going to discuss several of these methods just. Briefly, I'm not, I'm not expecting you to come into my lab and start uh, running this test, but just when you see the results and see the, hear the names and percent reductions, I just wanted you to relate a little bit to the process. How do we get these numbers? So uh, the first study, which is commonly used, called time, time exposure kill evaluation. This is called in vitro. Studies, studies done on the bench uh, with no human uh, involved in this testing. So as you see on these pictures, we place test product into the beaker, inoculate it with uh, bacteria, and then we mix it for uh, whatever time we decide. If we want to know uh, what uh, the bacteria, uh, this product kills in 15 seconds, 30 seconds, we de decide what we want. And for the duration of this time, we mix bacteria and the soap. Uh, then after this time is over, we remove some of this mixture and place it into a neutralizer solution so uh, the antimicrobial which uh, was killing the bacteria is being blocked. So this way we know that we tested it for 15 seconds, 30 seconds, or whatever our goal was. Side by side, we are running the same test, with, uh, uh, but without soap, using a buffer. And when, uh, so nothing is killing in this test. And then we are comparing the difference and calculating the percent reduction. So sometimes you uh, see the results uh, 90%, 99%, and uh, other versions 99.9%. This is the way how these numbers are being uh, collect it, and then you would be able to know what exactly was done uh, when the test, when the numbers were uh, obtained. Uh, this next test uh, called germicidal equivalent concentration available chlorine. It's also in vitro on the bench test. Many of you uh, heard about E2, E3 ratings. We are still being often asked. Uh, if our products are E2 or E3 rated. Uh, this rating was um, used by USDA, um, and it's not used since 1997, but uh, a lot of people who have been around for that uh, time, uh, they still are interested. Are these products meeting E2 or E3 rating? NSF actually still uses this rating. Uh, E2 rating is done for hand soaps, and E3 rating is done for hand sanitizers. Uh, this testing is supposed to show that the hand care product which uh, um, is being evaluated kills as well as 50 ppm chlorine. So uh, it is a pass-fail test, so if people are referring to E2, E3 rating, this is pretty much what they are talking about. And uh, the last test I'm going to uh, discuss is the test which is being done on uh, people. So um, people are being recruited, and it's a statistical number of people being recruited. Um, 
hands are contaminated with uh, bacteria of interest, and it is sometimes Horatia and sometimes it is E. coli. And then hands are washed uh, with the test hand product for 30 seconds. Uh, after that, hands are donned into uh, bags, as in this picture, as you can see in this picture, or gloves. And uh, these uh, gloves or bags have neutralizing solutions similarly to the time kill study, which I described before. And uh, hands are being massaged and, and bacteria uh, stripped off, uh, residual bacteria stripped, uh, stripped off into this solution and measured. Uh, the same test is being done um, with, uh, without hand washing, so we have a baseline. And this way, we can also say uh, estimate the uh, reduction for um, for this particular uh, product, and you will see again a 90, 99 percent reduction uh, in other numbers. So now, um, after I uh, made you officially a microbiologist, and you can go and run this test. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, differences between antimicrobial soaps versus plain soaps. And we all know that it's a lot of debates about benefits of using antimicrobial versus plain. So uh, this question is being asked and people are doing a lot of research to uh, prove or disprove uh, one product versus another. Uh, this uh, slide uh, we are, you are looking at uh, shows the pictures which um, were taken through during the study which was run by uh, and published uh, by Fisher and his uh, co-authors. Um, so what has been done in this study, uh, as you can see, the person uh, was, uh, the, the um, hands were pressed into a towel which were contaminated with uh, Shigella. Actually, I'm going to talk about the portion of the study when the Shigella was involved. The study actually uh, had another test with E. coli. So hands were pressed into towels contaminated with the test organisms, and uh, then hands were washed with each type of soap tested. Uh, Following the treatment with the prescribed product, the subjects were asked to handle the cannula melon balls, and um, the difference between baseline counts on hands and post-treatment counts were calculated. Also, the difference in transfer of bacteria to food was calculated. So, again, you can see the, if I wash my hands and numbers on the hands are high, then I probably will transfer more uh, microorganisms on these melon balls, and that's exactly what uh, the author was trying to uh, evaluate. So the next slide shows the results of this study. Uh, as you can see from the table, uh, the first column shows log reduction in 30 seconds of hand washing. Uh, using plain soap, log reduction was 1.5, and using antimicrobial soap, uh, this particular formulations, and as many of you know, uh, not all antimicrobial soaps are equal. So this particular antimicrobial hand soap uh, used uh, was a triclosan-based soap, so uh, they achieved uh, 3.1 uh, log reduction. Then. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, melon balls were handled and uh, then evaluated. So the melon balls uh, handled after the plain soap hand washing had 3.5 logs uh, of uh, Shigella on them, while uh, an when antimicrobial hand soap was used, uh, 2.5, uh, 2.1 was used. And these numbers are average of multiple tests, so I just averaged them out for a simplicity of um, uh, reading. So the antimicrobial hand soap was significantly better than the plain soap at eliminating bacteria on hands and at reducing uh, the bacteria on hands to food. 
the approximate two log uh, dose obtained for the antimicrobial soap uh, at, uh, was uh, at the lower end of the dose response range for Shigella flexionary and would be anticipated to result in significantly, significantly fewer cases of infection than three log dose obtained for the plain soap. Simply speaking, uh, if we, in this experiment, uh, there is a prediction that after using the plain soap, uh, more people will get sick than uh, after using uh, antimicrobial soap. Next slide uh, is our uh, attempt to simply uh, explain what would happen if people did not wash their hands. So we, uh, it is a hypothetical uh, picture which we draw, and um, we felt that's a, a good way uh, for training to explain to people what would happen if they didn't wash their hands. Let's say a person handled a raw chicken like it is in the picture and picked up about 1,000 colony-forming uh, units, uh, which is a, it's a microorganism, um, from this raw chicken. Then we looked at three scenarios. One was people did not wash hands and moved on um, handling salad. In other scenario, they washed hands with a regular hand soap, plain hand soap, and then uh, assembled the salad. And uh, the last scenario, they used antimicrobial hand wash. So we assumed, uh, again, it's all hypothetical, uh, the, we assume that regular hand wash would remove about 90% of the microorganisms uh, uh, living on the hands about uh, 100 microorganisms from a 1,000 initially picked up. And uh, we assumed, again, hyp hypothetically, that antimicrobial hand wash uh, would remove about 99% uh, of the microorganisms living on the hands about 10%, uh, 10 microorganisms. Then, uh, when people are going to handle the salad, not everything which ends up on the hands normally ends up on the surfaces which we, we are handling. So, uh, we again hypothetically assume that the transfer rate would be 10%. So, in case when people did not wash their hands, they transferred about 100 microorganisms on the salad. When they wash their hands with a, a plain hand soap, 10 microorganisms ended up on the salad. And in case in, uh, of antimicrobial hand soap, uh, the uh, number of uh, microorganisms were not detectable. They were less than one, one below the detection level. And uh, again, this is a very uh, hypothetical uh, scenario done for training purposes only. Uh, but as we all know, 1,000 uh, microorganisms, uh, it's not a very high number. It could be much higher if people went to the restroom and didn't wash their hands. Uh, the numbers could be much higher. So that shows uh, one more time that uh, there is a benefit of uh, using antimicrobial hand soap. So in summary, uh, um, uh, I wanted to um, put together some bullet points of everything I just talked about. Uh, personal, uh, poor personal hygiene is one of the main causes of foodborne outbreaks. As we noticed from the slides I had, hand washing compliance is low and probably many of us know that already. The reasons of poor personal hygiene need to be analyzed and changes made. Employees need to be trained on the proper hand care practices. Uh, efficacy of hand care products need to be evaluated following reliable test methods. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I would, uh, if you have any questions, I would, I'll try to answer them. At this time, we will answer some questions from the audience. is, what do you think of the use of air blades? My experience is that they are fine in patron restrooms, but the back of the house, 
tends to wash their hands less or not at all because they cannot dry their hands on the go as with a paper towel. Well, so the question is, um, should we use hand dryers in the kitchen and do they reduce the compliance, hand washing compliance while used? Well, most of the uh, hand care procedures are um, followed or not followed because of the training which we perform. If people do understand the importance of hand drying and full hand drying and follow it, then uh, there is no, nothing wrong with using hand dryers. Unfortunately, as, the, um, que uh, as uh, it was mentioned, people do not understand that and they do not dry their hands and therefore uh, most of the kitchens do not have hand dryers and use uh, towels. Uh, so my recommendation would be uh, to use towels in the kitchen. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, after washing our hands, is it required to use sanitizer before grabbing other products? No, food code does not require it. Food code uh, allows you to wash your hands properly and uh, if choose to use hand sanitizer. But as I mentioned, you cannot use hand sanitizers without hand washing. Hand sanitizers will um, probably give you another several level of safety, uh, but no, it is not required by food code to use hand sanitizer. Okay. What is your recommendation about using hand soap that is scented? Well, uh, this question comes a lot um, in, uh, as I mentioned, uh, USDA E2, E3 rating, uh, which used to be around and uh, used by USDA facilities. Uh, it had a limitation uh, on the fragrance to be being used. And the reason behind it that uh, fragrance could mask the smell uh, which uh, caused by spoilage organisms. So um, there is, uh, you, you really need to use, you can use scent, uh, hand care products, you need to make sure that they are not masking uh, the smell of um, spoilage uh, organisms. All right, how do you encourage hand washing compliance in quick service restaurants? Well, um, it's a million dollar question. Uh, the main thing which we are seeing in the QSR or in any other uh, food service uh, establishments that people do not understand the importance of hand washing. Unfortunately, uh, many people who come to work for food uh, service are not uh, washing their hands at home. And therefore, uh, by working, coming to work for food service, it's the first time when they have an opportunity to learn why do we need to wash hands. And as every education, uh, it doesn't come from one-time training. So A, people need to be trained, uh, people need to be retrained on a regular basis, and very important, uh, personal example of the management and encouragement from the management and uh, uh, culture of the uh, environment, culture of hand washing is very helpful for uh, people to start washing their hands. All right. Do hand resident bacteria pose any health risk? Well, there are, as I mentioned, most, most of the resident bacteria are not harmful for people. There are some microorganisms such as Staphylococcus aureus, which could be resident, which could pose the health risk, but most of them do not. All right, next question. Do I need to wash my hands at 100 degrees Fahrenheit? Well, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, the food code asks for washing hands in the warm water. Uh, in the other part of the food code, it tells us that the kitchen needs to be supplied with the hot water at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, many health inspectors or uh, auditing companies 
connect the dots and uh, ask for people to wash their hands at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I, I personally do not interpret that as a need. Uh, as I said, food code tells us to wash our hands in warm water. Okay. What are the regulations or requirements outside of the U.S.? Well, um, every country has its regulations. Um, we are uh, seeing a lot of uh, testing requirements uh, for different countries. Uh, Europe has a set of regulations which uh, we are following when we uh, develop products. We have to make sure that uh, we meet environment uh, European requirements. Um, some of the actives in hand care products which we are using in the U.S. are not allowed in Europe, and some of the actives used in Europe are not allowed in the United States. Uh, so again, it's a different test methods and uh, different regulations. So uh, if people are um, providing products around the world, they need to uh, learn the regulation, what kind of regulations are in each individual country and follow the rules. All right, that is all the time we have today for questions. Thank you, Dr. Anya, for the presentation. We would also like to thank the audience for your time and attention. Be sure to answer our online survey at the end of the webinar. As a reminder, all of our webinar sessions are available online at youtube.com slash foodsafetynet. Our next webinar presentation will be held on November 15th, and our topic will be Food Safety from a Grocery Store Perspective, presented by Darius Monk, Quality Assurance Manager from Lowe's Foods. Thank you, and have a great day.